Hello and welcome to Awesome Astronomy episode 85 part 2 for July 2019. Well, here we are, five decades later. What do these people think the world would be like in the year 2019? Flying cars? Irradiated food? Household robots doing the chores? Disappointingly for them, nothing's really changed. Adults are still moaning about the nonsense that kids listen to these days. We're still building walls, and we're actively going to the moon. <laughs> it's been 50 years since some of the bravest men, for they were men, sat astride three and a quarter million litres of very flammable fuel and prepared to be thrown at a dull grey rock some 384,000 kilometres away. 50 years since they rattled through the atmosphere and sailed quietly through the cosmos to make history. 50 years since Neil Armstrong took one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. 50 years since Buzz Aldrin figures out that the kangaroo hop is not the way to do the moonwalk. <laughs> and 50 years since Michael Collins became the epitome of so close and yet so far. <laughs> <laughs> it's here, the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. Joining me on this momentous occasion is my favourite pilot, Ralph. Whoopee, man. <laughs> Is that your, like, 60s slang? No, that's a that's a nod to Pete Conrad, uh, the commander on Apollo 12. Oh, okay. And best mm -hmm. commander, Paul. Command, I like that. Commander Paul. I like commander that. Commander Paul. I, like that. I go with Tom Hanks now. I'm just going to just stare wistfully at things and, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and just pause a lot. That works beautifully on a podcast that's audio only. Yeah, I'm staring. I'm staring now. I'm staring wistfully. <laughs> oh, that's 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 Oscar. Stare. I'm looking at that <laughs> abort button, thinking maybe, maybe. <laughs> it's two chiseled draw. Two chiseled draw. Two chiseled jaw. No. <laughs> <laughs> Can be a drizzle. Two chiseled jaw to be using an abort button, Paul. Mm. But I've got to think about it. I've got to look for it wistfully and think oh, maybe I should. Yeah. Maybe I should. Maybe I shouldn't put these people in danger. Yeah, All the look, every, everything, crew, everything's you know. in that look. It's in the look. It's in the look. I'm the so hands on the handle. Yeah, but god damn it, you're not going to use it unless you have. No, but, but, it. It's, I've but got, it won't be for your sake. It'll be. I've got to. I've got to give that whole message in that look that I care, yeah. but also I'm not going to do it. I can't remember which one of the Apollo astronauts it was. One of the uh, commanders of the missions in Apollo that said, "Got his hand on the abort handle." but there was no way on earth he was ever going to use it. <laughs> Regardless, there was no way he was going to use yeah. it because mm. the guys next to him would never have forgiven him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Under any circumstances. So, quick chat time. Um, firstly, I think congratulations are in order for Jess Wade. MBE. MBE, she's on the honours list. Um, yeah. If you haven't heard of Jess Wade, um, she has been... She's taken on the mammoth task of making the science part of wikipedia a little bit more diverse so she's been she's been campaigning now for years and, and she's been writing wikipedia articles for sort of the unsung women scientists and engineers uh that are out there and writing uh wikipedia pages for them and she's inspired people to sort of you know help her take up the mantle and we do them in um in the university sometimes we have wiki thons i think they're called and um <laughs> we get together for a few hours and try and contribute to some of these articles and just try try and make it all a little bit of a more diverse place so congratulations to jess wade yeah she's done amazing work really really cool really well deserved it she really deserves to become a member of a a defunct and non-existent um empire empire mm. oh but it's a nice medal it's a nice medal. It is a nice yeah. medal. No, and, and genuinely, you take it for the honour rather than yeah. for the uh, yeah. the membership no, I, of the British yeah. Empire. I, 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 I joke because yeah. I always do when it comes to MBs, OBs, uh, being the Republican that I am. Um, but <laughs> um, no, it's, it's a well deserved, a well deserved award because she has done sterling work, sterling yeah. work, really well deserved. It was amazing. So Ralph, yes. the Apollo Eleven movie. Yeah, has anybody seen this yet? 
I don't know what this one is because hmm. I thought you were on about the one that's coming out on the weekend. Yes, so this is the one that's coming out in cinemas in the UK at the weekend. Yes. It and came out in... It, it was at the Cannes Film Festival, I think, this year, and then it's been out in the US since, I think, about May. Right. But it was uh, it was shown on CNN at the weekend. Um, and ah. it is incredible. It really Good, is. Good, because I've got it's... tickets to go and see it on Sunday. Have you? At the cinema? Yes, in the cinema. It's in the cinema for one you weekend only. You are going to love it. Like this weekend as we're recording. Oh, I'm so looking forward to going. You are going to love it. You it's will be a... blown away. It, what it reminds me of, when, when Apollo 13 came out, I forget who the astronaut was. I think it might have been Dave Scott that was advising on um, on the movie. And, and he said, oh, I don't know where you got all of this footage from. It looks you know it looks so like remastered um and ron howard had to say oh no well a lot of it we recreated ourselves um but that's what this looks like so it starts off with the uh, the rocket the saturn 5 going out on the the crawler out to the launch pad and then it's the whole of the mission as it as it goes on and the launch and, and it does that kind of spacex thing of showing the altitude and the fuel and the velocity on the screen oh my gosh. That's, uh, it's just but but it's the oh, and there's also oh, a whole so load of unseen footage as well. It is really good. But the the remastering of the um, uh, of the video, it, it really does stand out. Cool. Oh, I'm so looking forward to it. Then I'm so glad you said that. So I know it's only in the cinema in the UK for one weekend. I'm gonna have to go and see it at the cinema. Well, I'm going. I'm gonna go and see it in IMAX. Yeah. Oh man. I'm very happy. Oh yeah. It's this weekend only, as we're recording. Yeah. In in Odeon's up and down the country. You should see if like your nearest one has got tickets. Yeah, well, Cineworld are doing it as well. Oh, are you a member? Oh, yes, I am a member. Oh, oh no. sorry, did you mean... Oh, yeah, am I a member <laughs> of Cineworld? Def- <laughs> you're definitely a member. People are always calling me a member. Nah. <laughs> 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 wanga, wanga, right. wanga. Should we go on to the news then? Yes. So, the news. A lot of this programme, as you have probably guessed, is going to be dedicated to the past. But we're also going to look forward to the future. So, Ralph, tell us what's happening right now in the world of space exploration. Okay, well, I think the big story that um, in space exploration this month is that apart from heading back to the moon under Project Artemis, which is more last month or the month before... NASA are now also committed to growing the commercial space sector and are looking back to the glory days when Dennis Tito and Anusha Ansari blasted off from Baikonur Cosmodrome for the International Space Station and netted the Russian space agency Roscosmos in excess of £20 million per flight. In the process, why aren't America getting any of that moolah, they're asking? Well, now they are, or they will be anyway. Mm. So NASA have developed a five-point plan based on recommendations from 12 companies that completed a recent market study on the potential growth of a low-Earth orbit economy and how to best stimulate private demand for commercial human spaceflight and other commercial and marketing opportunities and activities. Um, Now, if you get companies to do this, then it's going to be better than government doing this because it's going to be more realistic in terms of what companies can actually achieve. Uh, Now, most of the five points are far too dull to bother you with, apart from one that opens up the International Space Station for private astronauts to fly to the space station. And this is going to be as soon as next year. Um, the long-term goal... Oh, my God. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, let's not get too oh excited. Oh, my God. <laughs> it ain't going to be cheap. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's all right. We've got lots of listeners who love us very much, and so if we set up a PayPal account, they'll put money in it for us, and they'll send one of us, and they'll send me because I'm their favourite. Oh, send me. I'll be such an arsehole up there. It'd be brilliant. Yeah, you would, yeah. <laughs> oh, God, yeah I'm, I'm not going to get a look in here. Nobody likes me. I oh, know. Well, they'll send you, and you just be you just be like the most miserable <laughs> git up there. It'd be just amazing. I can't even get any sympathy from you guys. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, if they sent me, I'd just be distracted by all the shiny things. <laughs> I'd be no good. <laughs> no, the science experiments. 
Well, and shiny things. And shiny things. Oh no, I'd be that person who like presses a button when I shouldn't yeah. press do, a button. Do not press. Doing the. Uh... And then I like jettison half of the ISS. <laughs> Depressurize button. Do not press. <laughs> do not press often. So the long-term goal, which in this administration always seems to be around 2024, is to shift NASA R&D away from low Earth orbit <laughs> to deep space exploration and hand low Earth orbit operations over to the private sector. This was always the name of the last administration too, but we're a lot closer now and we can expect there to be significantly more commercialization opportunities. So it uh, be interesting to see what else comes out in that too. Now, um, Finally, but sticking with NASA, there's already more moves afoot to get that moon base underway. Yay, I loves me a moon base. Kind of makes up for uh, not having the hoverboards moon and jetpacks that were promised. Still waiting for that hoverboard. <laughs> um, so NASA's Innovative Advanced Concepts Program has selected two mission concepts to begin paving the way for a sustained human presence on the moon, which is currently scheduled to begin around 2028 and a concept for mining asteroids. Now, the first is a concept called Skylight, which would use high-resolution images to create 3D models of craters to determine whether a crater can be explored by human or robotic missions and to characterize ice on the moon. Um, on Earth, the technology is also expected... Oh, I like that. It's good, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And like I said in, in I like that. the astronomy show earlier in the month, we're seeing a lot more small projects that are all part of this big plan of just getting people to the moon. It's, it's kind of like, you know, when they did the surveyor stuff before mm -hmm. um, uh, before Apollo. Um, but they were also expecting on Earth this technology to be used for autonomously monitoring mines, quarries, and dangerous or hazardous locations as well. So it's kind of a tech transfer into stuff down on Earth as well. And the second concept is called the Mini B, and it's a flight demonstration mission for optical mining, which aims to propose a method of excavating an asteroid and extracting water and other volatiles into an inflatable bag, which in conjunction with other spacecraft systems in consideration could be used to obtain propellant in space, which of course is another key Ooh. requirement of deep space exploration. Cool. Ooh. Mm. Paul. That's an interesting one. Mm. Mm. Well, I've got two stories um, from me about the future as well. Um, and the first is the news that NASA has announced a very exciting mission in the form of a helicopter on time. Yes. I know, that's right. A <laughs> helicopter on Titan. I know. I know. Why the helicopter on Mars was a helicopter on Titan. I know, the helicopter on Mars was cool. No, this no. is even it cooler. Just, it it's just a quadcopter. sounds like completely made up. I just, it's brilliant. It's straight out of sci-fi, right? But it's it's the mission that everyone wants, isn't it? The o the only one I want really, actually, the on submarine. for this is, is... No, well, a boat. I want to see a boat <laughs> sail on the lakes of Titan. That just... Maybe they'll put Boaty McBoat face uh, onto the helicopter. But, but how cool. Anyway... This is a quadcopter. Quadcopter kind of drone thing. It's really cool. Mm. Um, and it's called Dragonfly. It'll be the first lander to be able to fly its entire payload to a new location. Oh, man. So it'll be able to, the whole thing, it won't just like, you know, bits of it. The whole thing will pick up, fly, wow. land. Um, the plan is to land and then hop across multiple sites across Titan. So we get a much better picture of conditions on oh the moon. Oh, my God. I know, which, of course, is an analogue of the very early Earth, they think. Yeah. Um um, so you imagine like a rover, you know, it's, it's going to be so much better than the rover, you know, the, the other thing of the rovers on, on Mars. Yeah, the coverage. The coverage, exactly. You can go like, well, we'll look over here, we'll fly a few miles that way, look this way, this way. It's just brilliant. Mm. Um, and it's going to specifically look at the prebiotic chemistry on the surface um, and is frankly as cooler than a night time in the Arctic. Yeah. It's just super cool. I mean, I cannot wait to see footage from a drone flying over another world. Yep. And that, especially just, one like Titan. Oh, it's just going to be awesome. Imagine if, you know, it sees rivers and lakes and, the, oh, God, I'm yeah. just going to... Well, you yeah. just think, looking at the pictures, the, the very few pictures that we got back from Huygens and how exciting they were oh, and how exciting exactly. they are now when you go back and think, oh, I've not seen those pictures from Huygens for a while. Yeah, think, yeah, oh, yeah. God, I wish it had sent us more back than that. But and this is going to be way, HD imagery of Titan. 
just just because you mentioned the magic word there, we it's going to be amazing. We did get tweeted earlier mm. uh, when we said we were recording by Raoul, mm. our friend Raoul from from Holland, who did say, "Let me know if you need somebody to give you the proper pronunciation of." Kuiper and Huygens. Oh, no, um, no, we don't. No, we don't like being corrected, though, do we? So is that Kuiper and Huyg- Huygens or something, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> I don't, I, well, we know we're going to get at least one letter of complaint for that. There we go. <laughs> yeah. so that, that's my attempt, and Huygen. I'm sticking to it. Chocolate sprinkles. <laughs> um, so <laughs> he's, um, he's my partner, nor shall my lover. Oh god! Oh no. my god! <laughs> we, we are going to get sanctioned or something if you two carry on. <laughs> By the Dutch. I love Holland. Holland's the most amazing place. They didn't think that in the 1600s when they came sailing up the Thames to take over London. Yeah, but you know, we should have let them out of it, frankly. That's where the term Dutch courage comes from. Yeah. Oh, there you it? go. You, you learn new things on this show. It's not just astronomy yeah. here. No, but Holland's cool. Holland, Holland is just the most cool place when you go there. They are genuinely just so... Chilled. Kind of chilled and relaxed. Oh, and why? just. And just cool. They're just they're just really cool. I, I love Holland. I, I love going there. Anyway, Crazy this launches guy. in twenty. Yeah, uh, this launches in twenty twenty six. Lands in twenty thirty four. Oh wow! It's going to take eight. Years. I know. Hmm. So it's um, yeah. I mean, um, but it's going so because we think you know it's twenty twenty next year. We're only six months away from twenty twenty. So this is this launches in six, six and a bit years. Yeah. yeah. And it, eight years to get there, and then Exciting. boom, we're there. So Exciting. yeah. I know. Um, and now, the, the second story, we now have a solar sail in space. Thanks oh, to... Is this the one that what? we saw at Sorry Space? No, 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 no. No, this is a different one. Uh, that was for dragging on the atmosphere. This is this is proper solar sail. So this is the latest... <gasps> this was launched in the latest SpaceX Falcon Heavy launch, mm. which was coordinated by the DoD. Uh, there was various payloads on board. Mm. Um and light sail two kind of hitched a lift. It's from the Planetary Society, um, and this little little cubesat like thing um, hitched a lift, and it's going to deploy a thirty-two square meter razor thin sail that will propel the craft with photons. So is that photons from the sun or from lasers? From the sun. Both? So yeah. So the photons coming off the sun. Yeah. Of course, they're massless, but they have momentum. Momentum, yeah. Mm. So they're using the momentum of the photons to propel the craft, so but, like a wind. But you could use a laser as well, couldn't you, if it was powerful? Oh, enough. yeah, yeah, you could, indeed. Well, theoretically. Mm. They've actually been tried. Mm. Um, and say so this is this is the big try, and they, they're seeing if this craft will work, and will it be pushed further into deep space using no power of its own, just the momentum provided by the massless photons of the sun? Mm-hmm. I know this is this is this potentially could be oh, it could fail horribly, uh, but it could be the future. There's so much cool stuff going on. I so much mm. exactly like two stories there: mm. a quadcopter on Titan and a solar sail. Mm. My work here is done. Mm. Gotta say, Bridenstine, he's um he has turned me around. Oh, I I I I I bow down. I'm I'm I worship at his altar. Mm. <laughs> So, on to the biggie, which is, of course, that this month marks the 50th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing. Ooh. Does it? I had. I mean, what else are we going to talk about, right? I hadn't heard about this. Mm. This somehow escaped me. Do you know me. what? It's amazing this... that this story slipped under the radar. I know. This is all about Apollo 11, right? It is 50 years since yes, man first is. stepped on the surface of the moon. And we can say that because it was men. Yes, that's that's mm. the point I tried to make in the introduction is that it yep. is man. They were all blokes. Let's hope that, you know, 2024 plus it's men and women. I say, I, I have to say, in between. I did like your little feminist rant there at the beginning. It was good. Thanks. Oh, I didn't think it was a feminist rant. I It was. No, it was, it was just like a little reminder. Yeah, yeah it was good. It was good. It was, a, it was oh, I liked it. It was good. It was like, very gentle. Just yeah. kind of nudge that in. Hmm. But yeah, I mean, where do we begin? Yeah. With discussing the 50th anniversary. At the beginning. Okay, so maybe we can talk about some of the stuff that is being done to celebrate the moon landing that we've seen. Just some kind of interesting things. Well, I know that my mailbox is getting absolutely flooded with people 
wanting us to review books and review videos and buy T-shirts. And there is so much commercialization yeah. of this anniversary. But some really good T-shirt yeah. designs. I'll give them that. I have seen Krispy Kreme doing a special donut for the occasion. What? Are you joking? <laughs> I am not joking. Why Krispy do we not have Krispy Kreme any? have brought out... Uh, and I'm hoping that, you know, Krispy Kreme will be listening to this and will send us a dozen yeah. or so for us to taste yeah. test. Yeah, why are but, they not uh, already? Krispy Kreme, yeah. Uh, I know, right? They um, So, you know their original glazed donut, the ring donut? Mm-hmm. Yes, very well, yes. Or, or I have to say, Krispy Kreme. Is it is Krispy Kreme, as my mum calls them? <laughs> She's so posh. Yeah, the original glazed donut, they're, um, they're filling it with cream... Not because it is easy, but because it is hard. Yay! Oh! Apparently. But I'm too. Wagga, wagga. Yeah, I know. It's, it's great, isn't it? <laughs> um, but I didn't know this, but Krispy Kreme were there for the launch of Apollo 11. They were giving out donuts to the crowd and really? to the crew and, and people like that. So oh. there is there is like a genuine connection there somewhere along yeah. the way. <laughs> but I just thought, Man. you know, I'd kind of point that out. So, you know, if anyone's strolling by, they might want to go and try one, check it out. Um, I think my favourite thing that I've seen so far is um, Apollo in real time. Yes. Com. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Now, they did it also uh, for... What was it they did it for a couple of years ago? Was it, maybe it was the 48th anniversary of it or something. But they are fantastic because you can either zoom to the critical bits or you could just do it in like full real time, can't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so if you go to the website, which is... Um, Apollo in real time dot org. Sorry, not dot com. It's dot org. Um yeah, you can tune in and you can listen to like what's going on, what people are talking about, um sort of as it happened fifty years ago right now. Or you can skip to, you know, kind of just before launch. Um and it's yeah. It's all historical uh data and it's all being collated together for your viewing entertainment so you can literally if you weren't there like i wasn't there um this is a great opportunity to literally relive it so um i'm gonna wait until it gets a little bit closer to the date and i'm gonna start tuning in yes see what it was like it's great yeah those are the two things i've seen that have really interested me so far well you won't need to after sunday jen when you've watched apollo 11 because that's kind of what that's like that is true Mm. that is true but you know Mm. I'm going to make the most of this. This is great. Uh, I think, Ralph, you've got um, a list of book suggestions. Yeah, well, I noticed that there was a um, a Space.com Best Apollo 11 Moon Books list, but um, what I wanted to do was kind of broaden it out because I don't think there are a lot of um, great Apollo books, um, apart from A Man on the Moon by Andrew Chaikin, but everything that Andrew Chaikin does is really good. He's a a journalist first and foremost, and... um, uh, yeah, his, all of his books are well worth reading, but I wanted to expand it out to the Apollo era because there's a lot of books on Apollo and a lot of books on Apollo 11, as you'd expect. But um, having gone through a lot of pain of reading pretty much m- most of them, um, I just wanted to point out the ones that are the real cream of the crop. And, of course, Gavin Price, who will be listening to this, who is the Apollo um, buff, oh. will either uh, agree or disagree. Oh, and I'll let yeah. you know <laughs> if he strikes any but, of those off the list. Uh, just add, if you're not following Gavin at the moment on Twitter... Oh, yeah, he's voracious at the oh, moment. Yeah. He's you, well you worth ju- following. You're, you're you're missing all the best tweets and and kind of nuggets about Apollo at the moment. It's just brilliant. Yeah, he is brilliant. So the books that I advise are uh, particularly for on uh, Apollo Eleven. Mike Collins, uh, who was the command module pilot for um, Apollo Eleven, and uh, a really fun uh, character. Um, his carrying the fire is probably the best of the astronaut books I would say the Apollo astronaut books anyway most of them had have written a book although interestingly Dave Scott did one with um, Alexei Leonov which is the only one that gives you a kind of twin perspective so that's really good from the view of um, both the American and the Russian perspective on space because what I realized after I'd read a whole load of books on the Apollo era was there wasn't much from the the Russian perspective, so that would that's a, a kind of nice window into that. Um, and then, as I've mentioned before, A Man on the Moon by Andrew Chaikin. But for the wider Apollo, the ones that I'd recommend are Gene Cernan's Last Man on the Moon, 
Um, Andrew Smith's Moon Dust, which is a really good book by a Guardian journalist that uh, of interviews with the, the living people at the time that had walked on the moon and the trials and tribulations that they had when they got back and, you know, could never live up to the kind of past glories of what they'd done before. Um, and then the best films, I thought, uh, were Apollo 13, obviously, um, and First Man, because um, First Man just gives you that kind of nuts and bolts engineering, how much risk went into it view that you don't really get from, um, uh, you don't generally get from Hollywood. Um, and what? And First Man is that film that came out a few months ago, right? Yeah, the Ryan Gosling, is it? Ryan Gosling film? Yeah, yeah. that was excellent. Yeah. I went to see that in the cinema. Yeah, I, I, I kind of... Um, and it actually moved me to tears. Like Really? It was... Yeah, yeah. I just think kind of, like, the awe of it when they actually got there and everything. Yeah. It was just beautifully done. Yeah, it was. I thought. And and what it really brought home to me was it took the gloss off. You know, you, you watch other films and you don't feel any yeah. kind of danger was inherent, whereas this was pretty no. much, you know, there was death at every turn and... Um, yeah, and you know everything is just nuts and bolts and rivets and and sheet metal that could crumple and under the pressures and, and yeah. yeah creaking away, which was kind of inherent in the right stuff the uh, the Tom the the version of the Tom Wolf book, um, but that was the Mercury era rather than Apollo, uh, so they're the ones that um, that I would recommend anyway. Cool. I think uh, you've written down some factoids, haven't you, Paul? some cool little things about Apollo 11 because the thing is like you you guys know the story of Apollo 11 you can go online and you can watch the archive footage so that there's no point us kind of going through mm. what Apollo 11 was um and there are going to be so many TV programs and stuff on at the minute but we just thought we'll, we'll try and give you something a little bit different and direct you to uh the places where you can find good reliable information and maybe provide you with things that you know they will not necessarily be highlighted in in all of the documentaries and things. I I haven't written this. No, I wrote those down, but oh. I figured I've already. I, spoken oh, you wrote them. Yeah. I know f- all about this. <laughs> Do you actually? Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, I'm saying that like I know everything about this, but I don't know. Yeah. This is the thing. I, I I think I know what the general public know. I wouldn't say that I know very interesting things. Mm. But you've got some stuff then, Ralph. Yeah, so I thought uh, it was Paul, but no, no, well, no it's, not me. it's just about the the kind of wider thing. So everyone knows the story broadly of Apollo. Everybody broadly knows the the story of somebody going to the moon, and everyone's seen the footage. Um, but it's it's kind of like the the more kind of fun side of things that you get when you hear about, like you read Gene Cernan's book or you read um, um, Al Warden's book, and you 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 pick up that you know just how human these people were, and you read. I think it's Mike Mullane, um, the shuttle astronaut, who wrote a book that was phenomenally honest, and he was talking about just how chauvinist they were and how human they were and how alpha they were. And I've never heard a, never read a book that was just as honest as that, um, which was horrendous to read, but really good to get the um, uh, the actual truth of the matter. But it's, it's that kind of wider stuff yeah. that you don't hear about because NASA obviously wants to put a nice gloss over it. But, you know, I, I remember when I was growing up, it wasn't until my 20s, I think, when I, when I watched Apollo 13 that I even knew that there was any trip to the moon, a trip to the moon, a mission to the moon beyond Apollo 11. I only, only knew that uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin had worked on the, walked on the moon until then. You know, not that there were 10 others. That, that certainly, I wasn't aware of that. Um, I wasn't aware that Apollo 12 got struck by lightning um, in the first few minutes of the flight and that you know if it wasn't huh. for for systems that they didn't even know could get cycled um on the fly you know they basically shut down the electrics on the uh, albine shut down the electrics on the on the saturn 5 and rebooted it um and it just carried on going oh my god but can you, you know imagine that getting struck by uh, that's insane <laughs> And that... Uh, that is... Uh, oh, my God. If anyone ever complains their computer's not working and exactly. they haven't tried switching it on and off again, that is the example. Yeah, imagine being on a Saturn V rocket when it's laden with fuel and you get struck by yeah, lightning. Yeah, and you're turning it off and on again. Yeah. Um, I can't believe he actually turned it off and on again to fix it. They didn't even need to call IT. Albine knew what to do. 
Um, oh my Apollo god! Apollo sixteen, I think it was sixteen. Um, Jim Irwin, the lunar module pilot, um, because of um, vitamin um, depletion on the moon, because the exercise, well, the the stress um, and strains on the body, uh, the lack of potassium is probably a contributing factor to his the his premature heart attack. Um, and this is stuff that you just don't don't know or you don't realise, and that's why wow. they started giving them a lot more um, orange juice. Huh. Um, and uh, Gene Cernan on the, the la- well, his book is The Last Man on the Moon. He was the last man on the moon, unless you're Jack Schmidt, who says that he was the last man on the moon. Um, he um, he had a helicopter crash when he was well. He put it down to uh, a helicopter crash uh, when he was doing manoeuvres because uh, they used to use the helicopters as uh, kind of analogous to uh, to the lunar module. Um, but actually, he was uh, just dicking around in the Indian River off Cape Canaveral and showing off um, to the people that were on the Indian River. And one of the uh, the skis of his helicopter got caught in the water and, and it crashed and he got burns. And um, um, Jim McDivitt, I think it was, who was the, the head of the astronaut corps at the time or head of something in Apollo, uh, wanted him kicked off the Apollo 17 crew because of it. But um, Deke Slayton liked him, so kept him on that. Huh. But it nearly meant that he didn't get to fly to the moon. Wow. You know, there's just all these kind of things that you, that you pick up on that's really human about these astronauts. Hmm. Or, or, you know, the stuff that yeah. doesn't even make it into movies, like, you know, Saturn V's getting hit by lightning. It doesn't make a movie, but it's, you know... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and by reading the astronauts' books themselves, uh, you really do pick up a lot of a lot of interest in human things. And by contrasting them and, and seeing, you know, just how everything works in exactly the same way, it does counter that argument that there could never, ever, ever have been a conspiracy for NASA to pretend that astronauts went to the moon the knowledge that just all fits in together you know you couldn't just get together mm-hmm. and say right i'm going to write a book now and uh, and uh, and you need to mention these bits and you need to mention this too you know get yeah. your story straight you know it's just absolute nonsense well we're actually going to come on to conspiracy theories later in the show oh well that's handy um yeah so so nice little link there hmm. um, i think you've got one one final little factoid which i like uh, which is about what happened when they came back to earth Oh yeah, yeah. The Apollo Eleven astronauts—they um, were required to sign uh, custom forms on their return to Earth, um, and they, <laughs> they actually declared to be, uh, ca- that they were carrying moon rock and moon dust samples. I love that. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> mm. I, 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 I always love the fact they had to. Do, they all had to, didn't they? Yeah, they all had to. They also had to put in their expenses, which um, which was based on mileage. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, that's brilliant! But they couldn't claim for the journey to the moon because that was in a government vehicle. <laughs> oh my god, I love that! Oh god, Zob, oh, don't you love bureaucracy? Yeah, because I think in two hundred and forty thousand miles or something. Oh, we might be able to get some uh, some money out of this mileage claim. Uh, no, <laughs> no, no. But they didn't actually claim for time away from home, didn't they? I think they did. There was something they were able to claim, but it worked out as something like thirty dollars or so. I'm going to check this because I don't, I don't like not knowing when it's knowable. Carry on. Thirty-three dollars thirty-one. Buzz Aldrin's travel expenses for the moon mission. That's brilliant. <laughs> I love that they claimed expenses, but they couldn't claim for their mileage because they were uh, in a government vehicle. Brilliant. Love it. So, on to the debate, mm. I guess, mm. this month. As much as the court would like to hold session, actually in the court, the sheer audacity of the upcoming debate has forced us to retreat to the shadows for our hearing, for fear of public wrath. This month, our debate comes from a secure vault deep under the London Underground. Well, yeah, there are vaults. Mm. Where do you think the mole people keep their shinies? <laughs> As we debate <laughs> Apollo 8 versus Apollo 11. No! We cannot lose. We lost I know. Cassini last week, last month. We cannot yeah. lose Apollo 8 or Apollo 11. Well, the thing is, we have to. Because we have to compare apples with mm. apples in these debates. Yeah. Because the thing is, whatever we put up against Apollo 8 or Apollo 11 is probably going to lose. <laughs> right? 
So you have to put them up against each other. That way it's a fair battle. And I honestly think there are very, very strong arguments for both of these winning. It just depends how you guys pitch it to me. Mm. So one of them is going. Mm. I can I can hear the chorus of outrage now as we're recording already. <laughs> But one of them is going. Mm. Uh, I'm I'm not going to look at the script for this, so it's going to you know be entirely audio based. You you have to convince me. Mm. You can't because I didn't uh, even put mine on the I, script. <laughs> yeah, appreciate that, Paul. Oh. That's good because it means I can't look at it. I think Paul right. was wise as well. And I mean, put... he got to see my argument while he was writing his. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, more for you. But I've purposely been skimming over your arguments so mm. that uh, I'm not swayed. Mm. I am getting my stopwatch out. Oh, wait. Do we stopwatch this no, at three no, minutes? No, 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 no. No, no we don't? <laughs> no, 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 no. No, no, no. I feel no, no, like no, no, it was a yes, yes, yes last time. No, 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 no. Well, I'm still going to time you because I want to know who drones on the longest because that's right definitely going to factor into my... Uh, into my uh, argument. Oh. Right, Paul, when you're ready, I will start the timer. Let's hear you advocate for Apollo 8. Right then. My lady, gentlemen and ladies of the jury, when we do things for the first time, we learn our greatest lessons. When we see things for the first time, we understand the gulf between our knowledge and ignorance. We bear witness today to the testimony of one of the greats, nay, dare I say, the greatest of crewed missions in space. You will hear about the special place that Apollo 11 has in the history of humankind, and doubtless it is one of the pinnacles of human achievement. But Armstrong, Aldrin, Collins, they were not the first to visit the moon. Land, yes, but theirs was an effort that was the outcome of disaster and progress. It was the final result of an incredible effort, an effort that helped forge a level of certainty that someone would eventually land on our celestial neighbour. Theirs was a mission of probability built of a growing confidence that was stacked on the shoulders of previous endeavours. In fact, by the time the crew of a Columbia and Eagle had entered lunar orbit, they were the seventh, eighth and ninth humans to do so on a spacecraft that had flown that journey twice before. But it is to the first that I turn, if I may. Humanity's first attempt to leave our cradle and travel to deep space. I do, of course, speak of Frank Borman, Jim Lovell and William Anders, the crew of Apollo 8. Humanity had been in space for seven years and launched only 27 times when Apollo 8 lifted off at 7.51am on the 21st of December 1968. One of those 27 flights had killed its occupant the year before. America had only flown one crew in space in the previous two years. The first time this capsule had been used, it killed its crew. No one had flown on a Saturn V, and at the one attempt to launch that booster into a translunar orbit, it had failed. This was exploration at the very edge of capability and reason. It was a mission that was not originally planned as it happened. Apollo 8 was to be a D mission to test the lunar module in Earth orbit, with the crew being made up of James McDivitt, David Scott, and Russell Schwickert. Borman's crew was scheduled for Apollo 9. Mission E, which would be a further lunar module test in a longer elliptical Earth orbit. Then two things happened. The first lunar module arrived at Kennedy and was found to have over a hundred faults. It would not be ready to fly, and then there were the tortoises. 22 and 37. The Soviet Union had sent the first Earthlings in Zon 5 around the moon in the form of tortoises and some fruit flies. 9 September 1968. The rumour opinion was that cosmonauts would follow by the end of the year. The race was on. NASA needed to do something to keep the momentum, boost morale and strike out for the win in a competition which they always appeared to be on the back foot. A change of crew, a change of payload, and the Apollo 8 we know was born. The world's first deep space mission, the first spacecraft to orbit another world, the first humans that would ever lose sight of Earth and be truly alone in the universe. This was a mission of firsts. The first translunar injection by a crew. The first humans ever 
at 10,800 meters per second. The first humans to see the entire Earth. The first humans to come under the gravitational influence of the moon. All the while guided, not just by a primitive computer, but also the sextant star sightings of Jim Lovell, navigating by the stars the first human ship to leave the relative safety of shore and plunge out into the ocean of the universe, just as we had for thousands of years in our explorations of Earth. 55 hours into the mission, they were there. The point where the moon's gravity was more important than Earth's. Then came probably the most heart-stopping, dangerous part of the mission. Out of sight of Earth, Apollo 8 would fire its engine and drop into lunar orbit. No one on Earth could watch, monitor or intervene. This was as it had always been, explorers far from home, alone with their ship, do or die. It of course worked, history was made. And while those 20 orbits and all those firsts do indeed make 8 a great mission, it is the crew that made it the greatest. A mission that has resonated in every home, in every government and perhaps every individual on the planet. For most of a month this year, climate protesters occupy parts of London. Extinction Rebellion, a protest movement that has been spread around the world and is the latest in a long line of environmental campaigns that seek to change the path our world has been treading since before the Industrial Revolution. But all these campaigns have a single origin story, and it starts in the hands of the crew of Apollo 8, over 200,000 miles into deep space. At 4pm on Christmas Eve, Anders, photographing the lunar surface, looks up and sees Earth rising over the lunar horizon. Grabbing colour film, Anders snaps a photo that changed everything, everyone, a photo called the most influential photograph ever taken, whose appearance kick-started the environmental movement, a photo that has influenced policy and debate ever since. Apollo 8 didn't land on the lunar surface, but it didn't need to in order to be the greatest mission. Apollo 8 is a mission that resonates today like no other, a feat of human daring that revealed a truth about ourselves for the first time, an image of our fragile home suspended above another world in an infinite blackness of the cosmos. Fifty years after he took the photo, Anders summed it up beautifully. We set out to explore the moon and instead discovered the Earth. It's fucking good. There you go. Thank you, Paul. I will uh, reserve judgment until Ralph has uh, done his two cents. Okay, well. Off you go. I learnt last month that I should abandon any attempt at trying to do a faux lawyerly kind of thing and just get into the argument. So here we are. And I can't f*** around on Apollo 11 because I can't have this not going through. So Apollo 11 was the culmination of the whole Apollo effort, not just one of the steps along the way. If they'd stopped before Apollo 12, NASA would still have accomplished Kennedy's goal and the greatest mission in human history to that point... And since, only Apollo fanboys and space nuts know the name of the other men who walked on the moon. Jim McDivitt was offered Apollo 8 or Apollo 9. He chose Apollo 9 because trying out a new spacecraft, the lunar module for the first time, was more special to a test pilot than a glory shot around the moon. Francis Drake, Marco Polo, Ernest Shackleton, Charles Lindbergh, all familiar names in exploration but no one knows about their exploration as well as they know Neil Armstrong's. Everybody knows Neil Armstrong's story. While anybody who isn't interested in space won't have heard of Borman, Anders or Lovell, even if they've seen the Earthrise photo, everybody has heard of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. If people have heard of Jim Lovell, it's probably from Apollo 13. Everybody yet to be born until the day the lights go out on humanity will know what Neil Armstrong achieved. And not because it's Neil Armstrong, but because of that mission. If Pete Conrad or Dave Scott or Dee O'Hara became the first person to set foot on the moon, they would be the person to be the most famous explorer of all time. Because of that mission. Because of the Herculean effort to, in Kennedy's words, send to the moon 240,000 miles away a giant rocket more than 300 feet tall made of new metal alloys some of which have not yet been invented capable of standing heat and stresses several times more than have ever been experienced fitted together with a precision 
better than the finest watch carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communications, food and survival on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body and then return it safely to Earth, re-entry in the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, causing heat about half that of the temperature of the sun and do all this and do it right and do it first before the decade is out. And for those of a more metaphysical or philosophical nature, Command Module Pilot Mike Collins became the only human to ever witness complete and utter solitude. For half of each lunar orbit, he had no contact with or sight of Earth, in total darkness, complete radio blackout with Neil and Buzz on the surface too. That solitude would be repeated on successive Apollo missions, but no human before Mike Collins had ever been so isolated. No human within 4,000 kilometres. Listener to the show, Mel Gantley in British Columbia calls Apollo 11 an unparalleled achievement. It also becomes more impressive when one considers that no human spaceflight mission has travelled further from Earth in the 50 years since the first moon landing. He's not counting Apollo 13's lap around the moon in 1970 as that mission never landed on the lunar surface. Apologies to Jim, Fred and Jack, because that's not the same thing, is it? And that's the point. Not landing just isn't the same, whether it's Apollo 13 or Apollo 8. Both hugely impressive, but not in the same class. Then there's the science. Our good friend and listener Simon Latchinger points to it collecting the only samples from another planetary body, samples which enabled us to learn about the history of Earth and our own origins, samples which help us learn about the solar system even today. And being the mission that made NASA what it is today, a feat they've still not repeated since George Bush Sr. first planned a return to the moon, despite 50 years' advancement in technology. But it's not just the samples. It took the best images and videos of the surface we'd ever seen. It told us about the topography of the moon. A passive seismic experiment package was used to measure moonquakes. Core samples showed the composition of the moon, and the lunar laser ranging reflector told us that the moon had a fluid core, the exact distance from the Earth to the moon. It was a further proof of the accuracy of Einstein's general relativity, and that the moon is moving away from us. None of this was known, and it's also still working 50 years on. When Nixon made a phone call to congratulate Armstrong and Aldrin on the surface of the moon, he said, because of what you've done, the heavens have become a part of man's world. For one priceless moment in the whole history of man, all the people on this earth are truly one. Nixon said this certainly has to be the most historic telephone call ever made. And that was just 24 years after Roosevelt made telephone calls to Churchill to talk about some rather important and world-changing events too. We aren't celebrating the 50th anniversary of Apollo 8, but we are Apollo 11. But my final word goes to one of the men who made the whole endeavour possible, everyone's favourite Nazi, Werner von Braun, who said in 1969, what we will have attained when Neil Armstrong steps down upon the moon is a completely new step in the evolution of man. Nice one. Done? Yeah. I've got to say... Paul, that was beautifully argued for Apollo 8. And Ralph, I actually thought you did a really good job of uh, not just sort of waxing lyrical about, you know, going to the moon, but highlighting the fact that uh, all the science that came out of it afterwards as well and sort of the ongoing impact that the missions had. I will say, you've not made it easy. But I think I have to go with Apollo 11. I think the thing that clinched it for me was... Because to be honest, Paul, once you've done Apollo 8, I was like, well... I didn't see that come in (laughs) and I don't know how Ralph is going to top this but the thing that got it for me was not not about because everyone knows you know it was the first time they went to another body in space and you know the the first time that people were isolated and and all this It, it was a mission of first but it's that lasting legacy that it's provided of of the science that we can still do with it today and although Apollo 8 was you're right, Paul, 
a huge stepping stone and most certainly Apollo 11 would not have happened without Apollo 8. Um, I think I think it just pips it to the post. But beautifully argued, both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. I didn't want Apollo 11 to go. It is the decision of the court that Apollo 11 remains and Apollo 8 is gone. Thank you, Your Honour. (laughs) so just to finish off we're going to quickly round up some common moon landing myths which you will undoubtedly hear people go on about Mm. over the course of this month um and now you know when they say to oh but what about this and what about that You've got the answers. And I also so, want to add to that, Jen, that if you go on to YouTube and you look for Apollo or moon landings or Apollo 11, anything about Apollo, probably about a third of the YouTube clips that you'll find interspersed with the other ones about Apollo or interviews will be moon hoaxes. And it's just frightening yeah. that it's all out there because... If you're yeah. if you're just learning about this, which most most people in their teens, I would imagine, probably know very little about the moon landings, but might think, "Well, oh, that's a bit exciting. What happened there?" You're going to see all of this stuff, and that's going to grab your attention straight away. Thinking, "Oh, is this all made up?" Yeah, exactly. So we thought we'll give you the ammunition so that when you eventually hear someone saying, "Oh, yeah, but wasn't it all faked?" You can go, "Come on, then, try me." Yeah. And that that was my best fighting voice. That was then. Don't f- with Jen. Yeah. Except, uh, from Barry, mate, you don't want to try it. <laughs> <laughs> did that sound hard? Yeah, it did. As yeah, they I'm say, scared. Barry, did it sound right? I'm going to kick off with uh, the first bullet point, yeah. um, and this is just kind of your overarching argument mm. for why was the moon landing not faked, mm. and that is because uh, people often say, "Oh, they just paid the astronauts to keep quiet, and they paid the engineers to keep quiet." Right. But it's not just about the astronauts and like the immediate engineers and the people um, back down in the base and everything, right? Over the course of the Apollo program, 400,000 people worked on it. Mm. How the hell do you convince 400,000 people to keep their mouth shut for 50 years? It just ain't happening. And it comes back to that Mitchell and Webb sketch where... It's basically, if you're going to pay all these people to do this, and they all had jobs to do this, so, you know, it's not like they were just given the money and then told, oh, well, don't bother coming into work, or they had other jobs and pretended to be working on this. You know, you, you've you still got to fork the money out anyway, and then spend the money to make it look like you went to the moon. It would be cheaper to just go to the moon. Just to go. Yeah. It's mainly, yeah. was it mainly catering? Yeah, it's just, yeah. It's the cost of a rocket and catering. Yeah. yeah. But uh, but yeah, I mean, you can't... I mean, it, it falls down to that, that whole thing of the government are absolutely inept at everything, can't get anything right, except when it comes to a conspiracy. And then whether it's Kennedy getting shot, whether it's going to the moon or, or faking the moon, they're brilliant at that. They can only do conspiracies, but everything else is shit at. Yeah. <laughs> they can't collect tax properly. <laughs> yeah. But... But they can get 400,000 people to keep their mouths shut for 50 years, sure. And coming back to my thing earlier, you know, you read the books from the astronauts and from the engineers and you read the books of people that were journalists at the time or that were um, people working on the, the space suits, you know. The f- stories just all fit as though there were this 400,000 people or the, I don't know, 2,000 people that were that have written books about it were all in one room going, right, let's get our story straight, guys, on all of these diverse little bits no it's quite yeah. apparent when you read the matter that they all intersect in different bits there's this huge panorama story that only works if they actually went to the moon yep 100 percent. so the next point is the flag does anyone want to take that yeah quite happy to <laughs> <laughs> so this is the one about you can see the flag quote unquote waving yep. in the wind yep it's just newtonian forces every action has an equal and opposite reaction 
Um, the flag, um, you'll actually, you can actually see it quite clearly that when they put the flag in the ground, there's another rod that goes over the top of the flag, um, and the flag is suspended from that. So when they move the flag, when they move the flagpole, the flag will move uh, with the um, with the rigid pole that it's with and it will move back and it will just gradually oscillate until it until it stops moving yeah and it does and in fact it will it will move longer and, and continue to ripple because there's no there's no air friction to to slow it down and there's less gravity yeah so it actually oscillate for a longer period anyway than it would on earth it's just physics people it's just physics just simple physics and the flag looks all wavy because um, they actually struggled to get the rod along the top of the flag to extend fully. So the rod is not actually extended fully, which is why it looks all crumpled up. Mm -hmm. And it looks like it's wavy because it's not pulled out and, as far as it should be. And the fascinating thing about it is that all the flags by now are probably bleached white. Yes. Because of oh, the, and and the radiation. Because yeah. of the, the solar, the, the light from the sun is probably bleached. Although a lot of them got blown over by and the... And certainly um, Apollo 11's did. They, module. They put it far too close to the module. Too close. I think yeah. I think Armstrong reckons it, it. He saw it being knocked over as they took off, and it was confirmed by the uh, the LRO. Mm. Um, the image yeah. lunar reconnaissance orbiter, yeah. yeah. Um, the, Which the, is another point. I don't think you've actually mentioned got mm. this one in the bullet points, but the lunar reconnaissance no, orbiter is such high resolution that you can actually see. I don't, you can't see the footprints, but you can see the lunar module, uh, the the descent stage that is left on the moon mm. for each of the missions, and mm. you can see the tracks from the uh, the lunar rovers. Yeah. Yeah, and you can Google them. Yeah. Yep. So uh, next is about uh, you can't see any stars in the photos that they've taken. Mm. Who wants to take that? I'll very quickly just say stagger out of a nightclub at uh, six o'clock in the morning when the uh, when the sun is uh, yeah. is out. It's just about exposure. Yeah, exactly. The, the the you've got the sun reflecting off the surface. It's just, it's daytime. Um, yep. And in order for them to take the pictures they took, if they had had the long enough exposures to 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 capture starlight, you'd have bleached out all the pictures of everything you were taking on the ground, and the picture you wouldn't it it just absorbed too much light wouldn't work. Yeah, and conversely, if you'd have pointed yeah. a camera up in the sky with a long exposure to take an image of the stars, then you wouldn't know it was on the moon because you couldn't have an image of the moon of the the yeah. ground in there because because it was too like bright Paul says yeah. it would overexpose the whole image yeah yeah and you and you particularly you're talking about old um you know film cameras and things so the you, Hasselblads you, yeah they, they wouldn't it just it would have completely overwhelmed the the, the picture anyway so mm. they were very short exposure pictures um because actually it was very bright the fact that mm. the, the, the astronauts got their visors down most of the time yeah they had gold visors to protect yeah. the and from the it, glare of the sun it's really really bright so mm. no in the same way that you can't see stars on earth during the daytime mm. because there's all this sunlight around well it's actually not that much different on the moon also if you took an image of a landscape with the sky at night and you had someone with a torch in front of the camera which mm. is far dimmer than the light yeah. reflecting off the moon it, you, you wouldn't see the stars either because your no. your, your sensor would be saturated no, with the it, light and in fact you try taking a photo even at night with the kind of camera they use, with the kind of exposure they were doing, you will not capture starlight, even in, in the dark of the night. It's physics, people. Yeah. So the next point uh, is the shadows. And the point here is that if you look at some of the photos, not all of the shadows are pointing in the exact same direction, which implies that there's more than one source of light. And if you're on the moon, the only source of light is the sun, and so therefore they were on a set using stage lights. And uh, this is rubbish, of course, because there is more than one source of light. You've got the sunlight, you've also got the light reflected off the surface mm. of the moon, and you've also got the light that's reflected off the surfaces from the lander. Mm. Mm -hmm. And the surface of the moon is not smooth and flat. No. The surface of the moon is lumpy and bumpy, and so then that will affect the direction that your shadows are in. Yeah. I mean, the simple thing is, if you scrumple up a piece of paper with a single light source, like a torch or something on it, and you put a pencil on it, you'll see that the shadow of the the pencil kind of goes in different directions yeah, when you've yeah, got great. the creases, which is kind of like analogous to the lunar surface. And, mm -hmm. and coming back to your point about the spacesuits and the, um, the lunar module, well, the lunar module is basically made of tinfoil, 
uh, hugely yeah. reflective, and the Apollo yeah. suits are white, purposely yeah, to so be hugely reflective. Light. You don't want them absorbing light and, and energy. You want them reflecting it to keep them nice and cool, or as cool as you can do yeah. in the full glare of the sun. But, um, yeah, it, it's physics, people. Yep. Next one is there's that really famous photo where you've got Armstrong um, reflected in Aldrin's visor. Mm-hmm. And uh, the question is always like, oh, well, who's holding the camera? <laughs> uh, because you can clearly see that he's like not holding his arms up to hold up a camera. Uh, no. <laughs> hmm. On the suits, they the camera is actually mounted on the chest plate of the suits. Because if, if you if you looked at the gloves on the spacesuits <laughs> that they wore... <laughs> I mean, people talk about sausage fingers, right? <laughs> that this doesn't even come it's close like doing that to what with they were trying to gloves. deal with. Can you imagine if they were trying to, like, operate a camera with, like, holding on to it with their gloves whilst trying to keep their balance on the moon? No, it's not happening. So if you have a look at the photo, you'll see that the his arms are kind of near his chest. And that is exactly where the camera is mounted. So... The picture is correct. It is exactly how you would expect it to be. Yep. Um, and you can you can look at images from the moon on um, le- subsequent missions that you know you can see that it is actually mm. clipped onto their chest because they've kind of got a lot of equipment and, and and experiments that they're doing while they're on the moon as well. They can't be having a camera in one hand all the time or putting it down and then going back to go and retrieve it. So it's just clipped onto the chest. Yeah. Uh, next one is that there's no blast crater. So the idea is is that um, when they they land, why isn't there a great big giant hole where they've landed from the from the rocket bringing them down? Yes, because it's actually it wasn't that much thrust. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's it's it really didn't because the the lunar module I think it 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 weighs a ridiculously small amount of weight on the moon because of course the gravity of the moon is so much less. Yeah. I remember how you know I had this dis- actually had this discussion on Twitter a few years ago with some nutter, <laughs> and actually wor- we worked out sort of what what the weight was on the moon, um, and it, it's tiny because it's it's I mean the lunar module's launch mass is is tons like sixteen tons I think it is, um, of course on the surface of the moon it, it it's a sixth it's a sixth of that. Um, so it's a, it's actually much less weight, um, and the the thrust was was just it didn't really need that much thrust. Um, it, it's not this sort of as you imagine on Earth, you know, a big blasting rocket that's going to sort of create a big burn crater in the ground. It just doesn't. Um, it, its engine is just not that powerful. But also, its rock just covered in like regular well do, mm. uh, bits of bits of micrometeorite and bits of. Uh, kind of like fine grained rock, uh, so all it does is blow away that fine grained rock to leave the actual bedrock um, yeah. on the surface. And and you can look at the Saturn V. You know, I, I, one of the questions that I always used to ask myself is, and, and this wasn't because I because I'm a conspiracy theorist. I was just thinking, how is it that it doesn't melt the scaffold, and how come the Saturn V doesn't melt the the concrete that it's blasting off from? And now, okay, they pour a lo- whole load of water in there. Um, while while it's launching, but that's a Saturn V, and it doesn't it doesn't leave a blast yeah. crater yeah. when it when that's it takes a Saturn off. Five. That's a Saturn V, not a lunar module. Yeah, yeah, it's the the engine. I mean, the uh, the descent propulsion system. Um, its thrust is um, just over ten thousand pounds. Is that right? Yeah, it's nothing. That's nothing. It's nothing. It's, it, it's really really minuscule amount of thrust. Um, and that's at maximum when it was actually being used. I don't think it went above about sixty percent. So it's sixty percent of even ten thousand hmm. pounds. So it really, really wasn't that much. Um, interestingly, um, the pintle injector is used in the Merlin engine in the SpaceX rocket. Oh, it. so it like that. So it lives on. And a final point from me: if you watch Apollo Eleven you'll see just how surprised Neil Armstrong was when they landed on the moon and just how little disruption it left on the lunar surface. Mm. Um, he actually makes a point of that um, um, 
because you're watching it from a different angle, uh, Buzz Aldrin's view out the window rather than it being that that grainy image that that you see. Mm. Which actually, that image that that everyone knows of, which is from the camera that was on the uh, uh, a kind of strut that came out perpendicular to the ladder. Um, that one, the reason that the image is so bad on that one is because. Now let me get this right. They took the image from a TV screen because they they had an issue with the relay. So what you're watching is a camera taking a picture on a TV screen in Australia being beamed back to Mission Control. Yeah, yeah. Because no one actually well, has the original footage. My God, yeah. no one just horrendous. Conveniently, cra- conveniently, no one has the original <laughs> footage. Conveniently. <laughs> I will say that when I was talking about this to my wife, she was saying, well, it is interesting that on Apollo 11, the images were pretty crappy. On Apollo 12, Al Bean burnt out the camera. On Apollo 13, it didn't actually make it. Was the first moon landing Apollo 14? And if you don't know know it in any depth, you could almost make that argument, I think. (laughs) No. And talking of footage... There is always this thing about the crosshairs. On the Hasselblad camera? Mm. Yeah, so in the images, there are crosshairs, right? And in some of the images, the crosshairs look like they're behind objects, which would be impossible because, you know, there was this plate with the crosshairs in front of them, so the, the crosshairs always have to be kind of on top of the photo. Yeah. However, you only see these crosshairs disappearing in scanned photos that are poor quality and copied photos that are poor quality. If you compare the actual original image compared to the scanned images where these crosshairs disappear, you get this disappearing crosshair because the objects that are kind of uh, underneath these crosshairs are very, very bright. And these crosshairs are so very, very fine. They're like 0.1 millimeter or something. Um, When when you do these poor quality scans and copies, the, the brightness of the object just bleeds across mm. and it just obscures the crosshairs. I've never even seen those images where they disappear. I'm going to look those up. Yeah, you'll see them. And it, you'll see, if you have a look um, properly, you'll find the original images, which are nice and sharp and clear, next to one that's been scanned and copied, which is slightly blurry, and it's in the scanned and copied versions that you lose the crosshairs, but they're perfectly visible in the original ones. Yeah. And, yeah, the final thing, you say, uh, really, is that someone will say to you, but why are the photos so good? Like, why? Why are they so good? Well, let's be honest, they're not going to put the sh- photos out there are they <laughs> no no they're gonna put the best photos which is what they do with everything they're not gonna take the photos where the the horizon is wonky or where you know one of them slightly lost and, their balance and then the image is blurred like it's not gonna and, happen but actually no. now you can because that's NASA, just what i was gonna say nasa have yeah. put them all out and you can go and see all the sh- photos they took and yep. there are some project apollo archive there are some garbage photos they took mm. and so i think on that note it's time for us to settle back into the command module and begin our journey home again how many moon rocks do you reckon i can hide in my socks for. Do you think they're going to check? I reckon I can get away with it. What do you guys reckon? I think so. Yeah, you got massive feet. You'll get a few in there. <laughs> you do have they preternaturally think... large feet for a lady. Mm. Me? Yeah. Huge. My feet are too big for my height. Massive, massive feet, like clown feet. Mm. Yeah, it's, like canoes. It's the kind of feet you'd imagine. I'm just trying to paint a picture for the listener. They're the kind of feet you'd imagine that if a clown shoe was actually full of feet. That, that's what. All that, right, they're not that that's big. That's what they would look like. <laughs> I'm actually just a hobbit, and when you see me, I've just like shaved my feet for Astral Camp. <laughs> <laughs> but do come and join us under the dark skies of the Brecon Beacons International Dark Sky Reserve on the weekend of the 21st to the 24th of September. You can book at astrocamp.awesomeastronomy.com. Come and share the eyepiece and a few drinks with us, and listen to us prattle on all afternoon on the Sunday where we've not yet failed to give away at least one telescope. Drop us an email and tell us your favourite memory of the whole Apollo adventure. 
And if you're that way inclined, or even what the race, the race to the moon means to you. Probably nothing if you're born after 1969. So, until next time, it's goodbye from Sidonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod.com or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening, and from Sidonia Base, end of transmission. <laughs>